Welcome back to this lecture series on CCNA3 scaling networks with me, Joachim Schauderstad from the University of Skövde. We're now reaching the business end of this lecture series and we're going to start with the first of three chapters on OSPF. So this is chapter 8, single area OSPF. The best thing about moving on to OSPF is that I no longer have to say the very complicated abbreviation EIGPR, even if I kind of got a hang of it towards the end. So, well, let's move on with some OSPF. So this lecture will cover OSPF characteristics, uh, the uh, shortest path first Jigster algorithm, the messages and the operation. Uh, we're then going to look at basic single area OSPF configuration for IPv4 and IPv6. And during the go, there's going to be two uh, practical demonstrations. And as always, take uh, a break in the lecture, even if I'm talking too much and too fast, or if uh, or to just do the practicals, because that is sort of the thing with this context-based microtraining uh, pedagogical approach that we're trying to have, that you should not just listen to me, you should go do things and actually uh, make practice of the theory that you're learning. So let's look at some quick facts for uh, OSPF that you need to know about for a theoretical quiz that's going to be presented to you sometime soon, I would guess. Uh, first, you should know that it's a link state protocol. Uh, uh, in opposition to EIGPR, that's a distance vector protocol. Uh, it uses Jigstra's shortest path first, the SPF algorithm. It's multi-vendor, it's classless by design, uh, and it supports authentication and encryption of RAMing updates, even if that's beyond the scope of this course. Uh, and it's highly scalable, uh, most, um, uh, in part due to its hierarchical design. And in the upcoming chapters, we're going to see how to scale up OSPF into large domains. Uh, so before we move on, let's have a look on the different components of OSPF. So we have the adjacency database, the link state database, and the forwarding database. And those are basically the neighbor table, topology table, and routing table. So that's a lot of nice words at once. But if we start looking at the adjacency database, it's uh, essentially a list of neighbor routers to which a router has established a bidirectional commu communication. So it's the same thing as the neighbor table in EADPR. This table will be unique in, uh, for every router, as all routers will have different neighbors, of course, and you can view it using the show IP OSPF neighbor command. Then we have the link state database, and this uh, is the topology table, and what it does it, is that it lists information about all other routers in the network. And this is the database that represent the network topology, and all routers within the area will have an identical link state database or an LSDB. And the thing here, this is what's special with the link state uh, routing protocol, is the topology table which contains information about the entire topology. And all routers will, of course, have uh, the identical uh, link state database as the uh, topology will be the same no matter what router you're viewing it from. And you can view it using the command show IP, is, uh, show IP OSPF database. Finally, we have the forwarding database, which is the routing table. And this is the list of routes that's generated when you're applying the SPF algorithm to the link state database. Uh, and each route, router will have a unique table uh, and it will reflect the best path from that router to any other network within the topology. And you can show, that, show this using the show IP route command. So that's the different OSPF uh, components and those you have to have uh, those you have to know, uh, especially if you're going to take a theoretical quiz. So if we look at the OSPF uh, PS operation, see and just briefly cover what it does. It begins with uh, starting up routers. It will establish adjacencies, uh, and adjacencies is uh, sort of another word for establishing neighbors uh, or becoming neighbors with other routers. When adjacencies has been established, it will start by exchanging link state advertisements, and those are the routing, uh, the packets that contains information about directly connected links. And it's going to flood those LSAs to the uh, neighboring routers, and then they will use the link state advertisements or LSAs that it gets to build a topology table, and all routers, as we said, will maintain a full view of the topology. And when you know about the entire topology, uh, topology, the router can execute the shortest part first algorithm to ca calculate the best routes. 
Uh, so before we move on, I'm just going to say a few words about OSPF areas because one of the scalability things that OSPF can do is that you can divide uh, one autonomous system into areas. And when you do this, you have the area zero, which is the backbone to where all other areas connect. Uh, and then you can connect other areas to area zero to have a hierarchical design. And the thing here is that, uh, as we said, when you use single area OSPF, all linked state advertisements has to be flooded within uh, the whole uh, within the whole domain, but you can limit the amount of flooding when you separate your network or segment it up to into different areas. Uh, when we do single area OSPF, we only have one area, and that's going to be area zero. Uh, but if you if you want, to, you can distribute or separate your network into multiple areas, and that's going to be discussed in the next uh, in the next chapter. Uh, so before moving on, we have to have a look on the OSPF packet types. Uh, all those PF packets are sent over multicast and they are called link state packets. Uh, and for OSPF, there are five types that we have to know about. First, we have the hello packet, and those are used to discover neighbor and build adjacencies, and then they are sent periodically to uh, maintain those adjacencies, just as with the AGPR. Uh, then we have the database descriptor, and the database descriptor is used to check for database synchronization, synchronization between router, and how that happens is yes, that every uh, that router will send a database descriptor that is uh, sort of an overview of the uh, of its view on the topology. We're going to look through those more in just a little while. Then we have the link state re requests, and that's used to request a specific link state record. Uh, which is uh, sort of requesting a route. We have the link state update, which will be used to send the requested link state record. And then we have the uh, link state acknowledg acknowledgement, which is an acknowledgement package sent in return to the other packets. So let's go through those in a little bit more detail. Uh, starting with the hello package, it's as, uh, said used to create and maintain adjacencies. It will advertise parameters that a router must agree on in order to uh, become neighbors. And they are also used to elect designated and backup designated routers on multi-access uh, networks such as Ethernet and Frame Relay. Uh, don't worry too much about that. It's something that we will go, uh, go through in the upcoming chapters. Uh, and just as with EIGPR, they are sent regularly uh, every 10 seconds for multi-access and point-to-point -point networks and every 30 seconds on other networks. And the default dead timer, namely when, when the link is considered down, if the router did not receive a hello package, that's four times the default hello, namely 40 and 120. Um, so, moving on to the link state advertisements. So a link state update is used to send one or more link state advertisements. And the LSA, the link state advertisement, is the package that contains uh, the actual routes. We will talk much more about this in the multi-area lecture up, uh, coming up next. Uh, but you should know that those updates are sent during initialization or when a topology change occurs. And this is what we call event-driven updates. Uh, next, we're just going to quickly move through the different operation states that OSPF can have. And as you see, it's seven different steps from down where we begin everything and to the full state where everything is converged. Uh, and it begins with down and the down state is the first, uh, first state that a router is in when it's started. And in this state, the router did not receive any package, but it sends hello package to see if there is an OSPF enabled router on the other side. Uh, so upon receiving a hello package uh, from the other side, the router will go into an init state and then we have a two-way state where we handle the election of uh, designated router and backup designated router for Ethernet links. Uh, so these are the steps that a router a two router has to go through in order to form an adjacency and when finished with a two-way state, the routers have an adjacency formed. So uh, next we move on to the X start state, and this is where we start synchronizing our OSPF databases. And the first thing that happens is that we have to agree on what router begins the sending of the database descriptors. 
And when we've done that, we do the actual exchange of database descriptors before we go into uh, loading. And this is where we exchange the link state requests and link state updates to actually gain routing information. And we also run the shortest path first algorithm here to calculate best routes. And when we're done with the loading state, we reach full and at that stage, all routers has converged. So we have a converged network where every router knows the best path to every, uh, to every network in the topology. Uh, so let's just have a, a picture on this thing that I discussed with designated router and backup designated router. So this is an Ethernet topology, and what happens when you have an Ethernet topology where a lot with a lot of interconnected interconnected routers is that you do get a lot of adjacencies. Uh, actually, the number of total uh, adjacencies will be the number of uh, router uh, times the number of router minus one uh, divided by two. And in this example, we have five routers giving us 10 adjacencies, but if we would add even more routers, there would be an exponential increase in uh, adjacencies. Uh, and this is sort of a problem because what it does is that it causes an extensive flooding of LSAs as all routers has to flood LSAs to each other in order to, do, do, to build a Linksec database. So the solution is to elect a designated router and the designated router is in charge of collecting and distributing the LSAs. So what happens in a network like this is that when you select a designated router, all other routers will send their link state advertisements to that router and that router in turn will distribute it to all the other routers. Uh, you will also select a backup designated router and that one is there as a backup in case the designated router fails. Notice though that this does not affect routing decisions or the path that will be taken, it's just about the distribution of the updates. So we're going to go through this in much more detail in one of the upcoming chapters as well. But for now, just know that it's, a, it's something that exists. Um, so let's uh, before we move on to how to do OSPF in practice, let's talk a little bit about the router ID. Because uh, in OSPF, every router needs to have a, have a router ID. It's a 32-bit value looking like an IPv4 address, and it's used to uniquely identify the router, and it's also used in the election of designated router and backup designated router. Uh, and how to set the ID is to either statically configure it, and if there is no statically configured uh, ID, the highest IPv4 address on a loopback interface will be used, and if that, that doesn't exist, the highest IPv4 address on a physical interface will be used. So that's it for how the ID is selected. Now uh, it's time to contemplate and see if there are any questions that you have. I will not be able to answer them as this is a video recorded lecture, but if you're in class, take, uh, take a pause and ask your supervisor. If you're at home, leave it in the comments field and I will answer any year. Uh, so let's move on to the configuration steps. And actually configuring OSPF is very much like configuring EIGPR or any other routing protocol. First, you have to enable the OSPF process and you do that by doing router OSPF and the process number. And then you set the router ID with the command router ID and the ID number that you wanna have. And then you enable OSPF for networks with a network command. And in this case, you do the network, you do the network address, you do the wildcard mask. And then since OSPF can run in different areas, you also have to append area and the area number. And remember for a uh, single area OSPF, the area number will always be zero, but, uh, but it will be different in multi-area OSPF as we will explore in the upcoming lesson. So finally, configure passive interfaces, passive interface, interface, name and interface number like passive interface gigabit ethernet 1-1 or whatever so finally before doing a practical we're going to look at the ospf metric uh, and ospf uh, uses a metric that is calculated by combining a cost of each link in a route and using cisco routers the cost is derived from the bandwidth uh, and the bandwidth uh, or the cost to traverse a link is calculated from taking the bandwidth in bits per second and divide that by the reference bandwidth. 
and the reference bandwidth by default is 100 millions uh, but you can modify it with the command auto cost reference bandwidth and then the megabytes per second that you want uh, there is a problem here and that is that minimum cost that a route can have is one so if you look at the table here you can see that fast ethernet is uh, 100 to megabits per second and that is 100 million bits per second uh, which would make the metric one but also every fast or faster links will also have the metric one because the calculation of taking the reference bandwidth and divide that with the link bandwidth will be lower than one but one is the lowest possible so this makes ospf think that all links that are fast ethernet or faster will have the same cost and that will uh, can cause for suboptimal routing uh, if you want to you can also set the uh, ospf metric of a link manually by using the interface command ip ospf cost and a number so as i said ospf uses the combined metric so it calculates the combination of all of the cost of all paths from one network to another and just to show you here if you want to go from uh, router one to the network uh, to the local area network attached to router two the total cost would be 64 for the link here plus one for the link here so the combined metric would be 65. and this also means that ospf doesn't always take the route with the least hops it takes the route with the lowest combined cost so uh, just a few verification commands uh, if you want to verify that everything works as it should, you can use show IP OSPF neighbors that will list the OSPF neighbors, show IP protocol that will show you configuration information. You can do just show IP uh, OSPF that will show you details about OSPF operation, including when the shortest path first algorithm was last calculated, and you also see area information. And then you can do show IP OSPF interface to show you the state, cost, and some more stuff for OSPF interfaces. Uh, so, time to ask questions if you want to, otherwise we will go configure OSPF for IPv4 and then go back and look at IPv6. Uh, so, what we have here is a topology that we're going to use in Packet Tracer. It's the task 8.2.2.7. And what we're going to do is basically to configure OSPF for routers 1, 2, and 3. Uh, so, beginning with router 1 what we're going to do is to go enable and then we go configure terminal and then we do our router ospf1 to enable the process and then we're going to do router id so router id 1.1.1.1 and as you remember the router id can be set either manually like this and then it will take precedence uh, if you don't set it like this, the highest IPv4 loadback interface uh, address will be selected. And if you don't have that either, the highest uh, IPv4 address configured on any physical interface will be the router ID. Uh, so, next thing, we're going to uh, enable OSPF for the attached networks, beginning with... Uh, the, the client network which is 172.16.1.0 and we're going to write network in front otherwise nothing will happen uh, the wildcard mask which is 0 0.0.0.255 .0 and then as I said we have to append area uh, to decide which area this route is in and since we're doing single area OSP if the area is 0 so then we have the link networks beginning with the link to R2. We have network 172.16.3.0 and we have 0, 0, 0, 3 and area 0. And note that we don't have to do auto summary because OSPF is classless by default. Uh, so we do the link to R3 as well, which is network. 192.168.10.4 0, 0, 0, 0.003 area 0. And as you see, there isn't even any auto summary command here. 
So we're also going to do passive interface. So we do passive interface and then face pointing towards PC1. In this case, it's gigabit 01. I'm hoping at least that's what I'm consider configuring as the passive interface. And next, we go to router 2. And we're going to do the same thing here. So we start with enable configure terminal router OSPF one router ID and this time we go to two 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 and then we're gonna do our networks and we start with doing network at one seven two dot sixteen dot two zero to do the client uh, to do the LAN network shouldn't forget area zero and next we're going to do the network uh, 172.16.3.0 0 point 0 point 0 point 3 again area 0 and now we should see that there should be an adjacency formed um, and there is and we can verify that by do show IP OSPF neighbors and then we're going to do the last network as well, which is network 192.168.10.8.000.3 area 0. And then we do passive interface, you give it Ethernet 0, 01. And then we're done for router 2 as well. Maybe you're noticing I don't get any. Uh, points here in my completion, but that's because I'm just worried about getting OSPF up and running I'm not that worried about making a correct configuration according to the Cisco guidelines And that's also a pedagogical choice because you can't just do exactly the commands that I do You have to have a little bit different values for IP addresses and what you do as passive interfaces and what you do for IDs So router 3 let's go router OSPF 1 we can start with passive interface just to be funky and then we do the networks so we do network 192.168.10.8 and we go 0003 to apply the wildcard mask and we do area 0 there should be an adjacency forming There is a little bit slow. Then we do 10.4, and we, sh we should get another adjacency. You know that I do get a little bit worried when it takes time because it makes me think that I did something wrong, but luckily enough, I didn't. So finally, the client network 192.168.1.0.000255, and again, area 0, and that's nice and done. So now that we are done with this, let's go take in to go back to privileged executive mode and we can do some show command. So let's start with the show run. No, that's, that's not what I intended. Show IP route. And you can see in the routing table that we have some OSPF networks uh, installed in our routing tables. Those are denoted with an O. And you can see that the administrative distance is 110 and there are different metrics. Um, next we can do a show IP OSPF neighbor just to show you that we have a listing of our neighbors. We can see the dead time, which is how long it's going to wait for a hello package before considering the link to be down. We get the IPv4 address, what interface it's on, and it's the state that we're going to talk about in the upcoming lecture. Uh, we can also do a show IP OSPF topology. Oh, it shouldn't be shop. Uh, database. Show IP OSPF database, come on. So here is a listing of the different link states that we have. Uh, you can also do a 
show IP protocol, and you get the summary information about OSPF. You can see the passive interface, what networks it's routing for, and so on and so forth. So let's move back to the theory and look a little bit about how to configure IPv6 before we end all this with a IPv6 configuration task. So now something actually happened to my... So there we are. Sorry for that. So looking at OSPF for IPv6, we do call that OSPF version 3, whereas the IPv4 OSPF is OSPF version 2. So the similarities is that both are, of course, link state. They are shortest path first routing protocols. They use the metric as a cost. They support uh, areas in the same way. They have the same package types. They do neighbor discovery in the same way. They both elect router IDs uh, or uh, designated routers, and they both have router IDs that are determined in the same way. This can be a problem with IPv6 as you don't always have IPv4 interfaces, so that's something that you have to know about. But fortunately, at least the Cisco routers will tell you about that. And if, you don't, if you're enabling uh, OSPF on a router where the router can't determine a router ID, you'll be forced to set one. So the difference is, is that IP, uh, OSPF version 3, of course, works for IPv6. The source addresses and the address used for advertisements will be IPv6 link local addresses, and the destination addresses will be, uh, will be a multicast, uh, either a neighboring IPv6 link local address or a multicast IPv6 address. And for IPv4, it's going to be the uh, IPv4 equivalent. Uh, you advertise network in different ways, as with EIGPR, OSPF for uh, version IPv4 is done with a network command in router configuration mode, whereas you do it on the interface level in IPv6 using the IPv6 OSPF command, and again you have to supply the area information. Um, by default, or to enable the routing of IPv6, you have to do the IPv6 unicast routing global configuration command. That's also Im important. And there is a difference in how routing update authentication works. In OSPF uh, for IPv4, you do plain text and MD5, whereas you use IPv6 authentication within uh, OSPF version 3. So, just have a look on the configuration steps. You would enable the OSPF process by doing IPv6 router OSPF in the process number. You would then set a router ID. You and then enable OSPF on interfaces using IPv6 OSPF process number area and the area number. And then configure passive interfaces, which you do in the OSPF configuration mode. And of course, verification is the same. You just add IPv6 instead of IP to the commands. And with that said, it's time to go configure IPv6 before we conclude this lecture. There we go, back in, uh, uh, back in Packet Tracer with the same topology as before, but now the addresses are all IPv6. And we're going to see that configuring OSPF for IPv6 isn't really that hard. So let's just go ahead and grab router one and we'll start configuring. And as before, the process is basically that we have to enable it, set a router ID, and then advertise networks. So what we're gonna do is going to do enable, we're going to go to configure terminal, and then we're going to do IPv6 router OSPF, and we do go with one. So, uh, yep, the first thing we have to do is enable IPv6 router, routing with the command IPv6 unicast routing. And as you see here, when you try to do IPv6 things, uh, or at least IPv6 dynamic routing, and you haven't enabled IPv6 routing yet, then Packet Tracer or the router will tell you to enable it. So now that it's enabled, we can do IPv6 router OSPF1. And the first thing that happened is that we get a message saying that the OSPF process could not pick a router ID, so we have to configure one manually. Let's do that with the router ID, 1111 again. And that's basically what we have to do here, but I also want to do passive interface. And again, passive interface is used to tell the OSPF process to not send link state package, uh, that is routing updates out a certain interface. And in this case, we go with gigabit ethernet 
1901, uh, which is connected to the client loan, there is no reason to have routing advertisements sent out a local area network uh, with only clients. Uh, so now that's done, uh, we have to enable routing for networks and in the world of uh, IPv6 we do it by enabling it on the different interfaces. So we have to go see what they are called. Uh, apparently the client LAN interface is gigabit 00, zero so I have enabled uh, or did done passive interface for the wrong interface, but who cares. So let's start with going to interface gigabit 00, zero and then the command is IPv6 OSPF process number area and zero because we're using single area OSPF. And note here that even if you configure an interface as passive, you should still uh, do this interface uh, configuration because the interface configuration tells OSPF that this network should take part in the OSPF PF process and thereby be advertised to other networks or to other routers. Uh, so let's continue with the serial interfaces. Interface serial 100. We do IPv6 OSPF 1 area 1. A nice thing about this is that you don't have to care about network addresses and wildcard masks. Last interface and done. So now we're down with router one. We'll go do the same on router two and see if we can manage without any errors. Configuration terminal, so step one, enable IPv6 routing, IPv6 six unicast routing. And then we do IPv6 router, router OSPF one, uh, router ID, that's not an error message, it's just a remember message. So we do router ID 2222222222. And then we do a passive interface. This time we do it for gig 00, just to be correct. We go exit, and then it's uh, telling what networks should participate by doing the interface command. So we go interface giga gigabit ethernet 00, zero. and we have again IPv6 OSPF process number, area, and area number. And then we do the serial interfaces. IPv6, OSPF, process number, area, area number. And then we do the final network. And we also see that we get an adjacency with router one, which is all nice and good. So let's quickly do the final router, which is router three. And as we know by now, what we do is that we get to configuration terminal. We enable IPv6 routing with IPv6 unicast routing. We then do IPv6 router OSPF one to enable the routing process. We have to do a router ID. Actually, there is one thing that I actually that I do want to show you. Uh, so if we do uh, no IPv6 router OSPF1 to just remove that. Uh, now I want to do an interface loopback1 and I'm going to set an IPv4 address here uh, of 3.3.3.3 and the subnet mask can be anything. Uh, I'm just going to show you that now when I do the IPv6 router OSPF1 I will not get prompted to do a router ID because it will determine the router ID from the loopback interface. Um, meaning that I don't really have to do anything here uh, except from passive interface and we will do passive interface uh, gigabit ethernet 00, zero again and then we're going to do the interface commands to enable OSPF for, for the respective networks so we do interface gigabit 00, zero IPv6 OSPF 1, which is the process number, and area 0, because we're running single area OSPF using area 0. So, interface again, and this time serial 000, zero, zero. IPv6 OSPF 1, area 0. We should have an adjacency while we, if we wait a little bit. And the last interface, which is serial 0, zero, zero 1. And again, IPv6 OSPF 1, area 1 and waiting for the adjacency to form.
And there it is. That was very close to me thinking that I did something wrong. So let's go exit here again and we're going to just look at some verification. So we can begin with show IPv6 route. And you can see in the routing table that we have a couple of networks that we learned through OSPF. Again, it's denoted by the O in the beginning of the routing table. And the administrative distance is 160. Uh, next, we can do show IPv6 OSPF. And we can do a question mark to just review what we can do. We can look at interface. So these are information about the interfaces participating in the OSPF process. And we have the serial one, uh, ser uh, serial server zero one here. You can see that it's up. You can see the link local address. You can see that it's in area zero with a process ID of one. You can see what router ID it, ha it has. You can see when it does expect a hello package and so on and so forth. So with this said, we now configured IP, uh, OSPF for IPv4 and IPv6, and, uh, and we did it in single area mode. This will have to conclude this lecture, and when we meet up again next time for Shabber 9, we're going to look at multi-area OSPF. Thank you, and goodbye.